So it's no secret amongst the RE community that Resident Evil 3 was initially intended to be a spin-off game titled Resident Evil Last Escape. This was supposed to basically chronicle the events of Jill Valentine as she escaped from Raccoon City, which is pretty much the game that we got. But being that it was going to be the last game on PlayStation regarding the Resident Evil titles, or on the original PlayStation, I should say, they wanted this game to, they being Capcom, wanted this game to be the final in the PlayStation trilogy. So instead of Code Veronica being Resident Evil 3, which honestly, there's a lot of conflicting information on this because Code Veronica was never intended to be Resident Evil 3. It was always going to be a side game. Last Escape became Resident Evil 3. And so, here we are. Resident Evil 3 is my favorite Resident Evil game. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Now, I could go through the whole developmental history of this game, like many have done in many, many videos, which I thoroughly suggest you go watch those videos if you want history on this said title. But here, we're going to do things differently. We're going to do my own retrospective, but talk about how the game makes me feel, about why I love this game as much as I do, and why it's my favorite Resident Evil game. So, if you're new here, welcome Hit the thumbs up, subscribe if you guys are new, if you enjoy the content, and let's get into my Resident Evil retrospective. Resident Evil Retrospective. So Resident Evil 3 chronicles the events of Jill Valentine as she escapes Raccoon City. The game itself takes place before Resident Evil 2, during Resident Evil 2, and after Resident Evil 2. I know it's a little confusing, but that's just the way the game was designed. What's interesting about this game is that this game also does a lot of things differently that other Resident Evil games don't do, and it has some mechanics that we haven't seen since this game. So we'll talk briefly about that before we go into any story beats and why this game has such a special place in my heart. Mechanically speaking, it's almost the same as every other Resident Evil game of this era. You have your take controls, you have your point and aim with the different guns. But this game has a much heavier emphasis on action compared to the first game and even the second game. With the second game had a lot of emph emphasis on action as well. Nemesis, though, just takes everything to the next level. So, Resident Evil 2 introduced Mr. X as a antagonist or villain or whatever, a looming threat that chases you throughout the RPD. Well, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis takes it a step further by introducing Nemesis, who chases you throughout Raccoon City. And on top of that, his AI is immensely improved over Mr. X's. This game gives you choices every time you encounter Nemesis. Do you fight him? Do you run from him? Fighting him, if you play on the harder difficulties, rewards you in various items, such as uh, being able to get pieces for new guns, being able to get health packs or first aid spray boxes to be able to carry three first aid sprays. And, yeah, just different things. Eventually, if you're playing on hard mode... Uh, once you're on your second playthrough, after defeating Nemesis every single encounter, on your last encounter, you will get infinite ammo that you can apply to whatever gun you want. At that point for me, I always apply it to the Magnum to make the game, the rest of the game just a breeze. Uh, which typically at that point, you're at the clock tower anyways, and being as you're almost done with the game at that point, there's uh, no other reason than to just put on the Magnum. So... Some of the mechanics that this game does differently than the other Resident Evil games. The biggest one being the dodge mechanic. Now, say what you want. The dodge mechanic can be a little iffy. Um, the only time, personally, that I can actually nail the dodge mechanic is when I'm fighting Nemesis himself. Outside of Nemesis, if I try to use a dodge mechanic on, say, zombies, it's just not going to work for me. It's kind of iffy. There's a bit of latency when you push the dodge mechanic, and in order to dodge... 
um, you have to either press the aim button right when you're about to be attacked and then Jill will dodge. Or you can be aiming and then press X when an attack is coming your way and then Jill will stop aiming and do a dodge. There's two different types of dodges. You have your regular dodge and you have your perfect dodge. A perfect dodge will activate where Jill rolls and goes on one knee and is able to fire her gun at a much quicker rate. This is actually really, really useful if you're fighting against Nemesis because it also puts you underneath Nemesis's arm's length. Nemesis? Nemesis's? Nemesis? Nemesi? We're just going to stick with Nemesis's. I mean, it's singular. We're going to stick with Nemesis's. Anyways, Nemesis will typically attack in a punching kind of swinging motion. This is before his tentacles are activated, of course. Uh, but if you are fighting him on his early stages and you do get a perfect dodge, you will be underneath his arm length and basically he can't hit you for the duration that you are knelt down. Now, it's not a permanent time where you're knelt down. This is basically on a timer. So after getting in a good few shots, then Jill will stand back up and you're at the mercy of Nemesis at that point again. The game also does what uh, what was basically introduced for the first time in this series would be mixing gunpowders to create ammo. Uh, this came back in later entries, such as ne Resident Evil 7, Resident Evil Village, and of course Resident Evil 2 Remake and Resident Evil 3 Remake. The mixing ammo kind of adds to that kind of action feel. Uh, basically, it, it uh, kind of negates the whole survival aspect of things, in my opinion, just because anytime you get a surplus of ammo, then it takes away from that constant feeling of, do should I run? Should I kill these enemies? What should I do here because I have limited ammo? In Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, there was so many times where I just had an abundance of handgun ammo or an abundance of shotgun ammo. And again, that has a lot to do with the mechanics of the handgun or the, the gunpowder mechanics. So there is ways to basically break this. Uh, if you mix gunpowder ammo seven times, whether it be for handgun ammo or shotgun ammo, and it has to be for each. So seven times for handgun ammo and then seven times for shotgun ammo, you will create what's called enhanced handgun and enhanced shotgun ammo. Once you create these... Um, let's just say Nemesis goes down really quickly. The enhanced handgun ammo shoots very quickly, is very powerful, and is basically a Nemesis killer. The enhanced shotgun ammo, unfortunately, in my opinion, I don't really use it because it's, it's slow. It's just one of those things you don't take a shotgun to go fight Nemesis with. Uh, you're going to want a faster gun, such as the handgun, or you're going to want a gun that does more damage, such as the Magnum or even the grenade launcher. So the shotgun, uh, having enhanced shotgun ammo, doesn't really do much throughout the game, except maybe on hunters. But by that point, to be honest with you, you still haven't made enough uh, shotgun enhanced ammo to really make a difference. And you're still using basic shotgun ammo. The downside to the enhanced ammo is you can only use it on your basic gun. Meaning the starter Beretta that Jill has and the the first shotgun that you get are the only weapons that can use this enhanced ammo. The reason why I mention this is because if you are fighting Nemesis, you will be able to create an Eagle 6.0 handgun, which has a higher chance of getting critical hits on zombies, and it shoots at a much, much faster pace. This gun is actually very useful early on in the game, but as you progress and once you get the enhanced handgun ammo, you're really not going to use this gun anymore. The other gun that you get from fighting Nemesis is being able to create the custom western shotgun. Which is basically a quick reloading shotgun and a quick firing shotgun that Jill uses with one hand. Uh, to reload it anyways. This shotgun is extremely useful against zombies and hunters and Cerberuses. But again it cannot use the enhanced shotgun ammo which then renders this shotgun useless once you get that option the grenade launcher in this game if i'm gonna be honest i don't really use it uh especially compared to like resident evil 1 or resident evil remake uh the grenade launcher itself is just okay but the reason why i don't really use it is because nemesis can dodge your grenade rounds 
So, yeah, if he can dodge my grenade rounds, why am I going to use a grenade launcher? Like, there's no point unless Nemesis is knocked down and then I can unload on him with the grenade rounds. Which, I mean, I do. I switch over to my grenade launcher at that point when he's knocked down and to get a couple free grenade hits on him. But outside of that, he dodges it. So I just stick with a handgun every time I fight Nemesis because it's quicker and it does the damage. Speaking of other weapons that I don't use, we have a mind thrower in this game, which is interesting. The remake kind of fixed the problem that the mind thrower has, but we're not talking about the remake right now. Uh, the mind thrower itself is kind of like you shoot it at an enemy, it sticks to them and detonates after like a few seconds. I, I don't think I need to go over why this is kind of useless, considering how, what are you going to use this against? Right? So, like, you're not going to take this Mind Thrower and use it against Nemesis because he's going to wail on you. You're not going to use it on a Hunter because they're going to kill you. Cerberuses are just too quick. The only useful option you have is using this on zombies. But by the time you get this, there aren't very many hordes of zombies left to use this on. So, it's kind of a weird weapon to use. And honestly... Throughout my years of playing this game, I've never found a use for this weapon. If anybody's actually used the Mind Thrower properly in any way in this game, please, please tell me. I I just, I don't see the, the point of this gun. I really don't. Now, what I do like about this game, like, I like the option that it gives you to either play easy mode or hard mode. There's no normal mode in this game. There's no standard difficulty. It's either easy or hard. Easy mode starts you off with an assault rifle that has a percentage for your ammo, which is great because then you can just like mow down everything in the beginning of the game, collect ammo, and then you're good to go. In but but playing in easy mode kind of also takes away the option to to get certain things, certain items that you would normally get, such as the unlimited ammo uh, option from when you're fighting Nemesis. Playing on hard mode, as I mentioned, gives you that unlimited ammo as a reward for playing on hard mode on a second playthrough. But we'll talk about replayability in a second here. Hard mode also, like I said, gets rid of that assault rifle. Zombies do more damage to you, and you get less ammo throughout your game. But even then, in hard mode, you still end up with a massive surplus in handgun bullets and shotgun bullets. So, take that how you want. My favorite part of this game, my favorite thing, which to me is one of the reasons why this game stands out more than others, stems in the random factor that is built into this game, into this game's coding. Now, speedrunners have been able to go ahead and determine what playthrough you're getting, meaning that what events will happen or what puzzles will be in your game based off of certain frames. But I'm not a speedrunner, so I don't give a damn about any of that stuff. Like, all of that is just jargon to me. In my playthroughs, every game feels different. Every time I play this game, it feels different. Different events happen, different puzzles happen, and I am here for it. I love it. This is something that no other Resident Evil game has done except Nemesis. This is the only one to implement something like this. And it's beautiful. I wish more Resident Evil games did this. I think the closest we got is in Resident Evil 7, the, the password to Lucas's um, fun time of horror thing. Like, I don't, I don't know what the hell that, that thing is called, but Lucas's keypad, right? Like, if you input the keypad numbers before you find the numbers, then it's incorrect and it'll change the numbers. That's the closest thing you get to the random, the randomized events and randomized puzzles that you find in Resident Evil 3. And it's beautiful because you can't really have a guide in front of you, again, unless you're a speedrunner, right? This does not apply to casual players or, you know, non-speedrunning players, right? So you can't have a guide sitting in front of you because it just, it won't work. You know, like items will be in different places. 
enemies will be in different places. Different enemies will show up. So if you go into a room in one playthrough and there's zombies there, in another playthrough, there'll be Cerberus dogs. Or in one playthrough, if you're walking in one section, there'll be zombies. In another one, there'll be hunters. So I absolutely love this because it also applies to Nemesis. You'll be walking down a hallway. No Nemesis. Next playthrough, walking down the hallway. Nemesis busting through the wall like a Kool-Aid man. You, you'll leave one area, no Nemesis. You leave that same area in another playthrough, he's standing on top of a building shooting motherfucking rockets at you. So you see what I'm talking about? Like, I love the way that this game handles this. And it keeps you on your toes. There's, I've been playing this game since it released in 1999. Okay? We're talking well over 20 years at this point. And in 20 years, this game still finds ways to surprise me. Case in point, I was live streaming the game. I left the news station. And as I'm leaving the news station, Nemesis jumps off the roof of the news station, lands right in front of me, and is like, surprise. And I'm like, holy crap. I've never had that happen before. In, in the 20 years I've been playing this game, I never had that happen. And that was amazing to see. One of the other things, too, regarding this is because, like, I love playing arranged modes. And when Resident Evil Director's Cut released with the arranged mode... Ever since then, that's like my go-to playthrough, is playing the arranged mode. I don't know why, I just love the arranged mode. Resident Evil 2, I do the same thing, I play the arranged mode. Or, like, I, I play Side B, so like, in Resident Evil 2 Remake, I play Leon Side B as my, like, normal playthrough. I don't know why I do this, I just do it. So, the fact that Resident Evil 3 implements this as, like, a standard, and I don't have to click on an arranged mode, makes it even better. And I am all here for it. And this is a good segue into replayability. For me, replayability is one of the biggest things about games. You buy a game, you want to be playing this game as much as possible, right? Like, you just spent $60, $70 on a game, $70 these days. Like, Jesus, man, like, the companies need to freaking chill because $70 is a hefty price tag. Anyways, you pay $50, $60, $70 for a game... You want to feel like you got your money's worth out of it. You want to be able to replay these games. Where's the replayability at? Well, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis has a ton of replayability. Not only with the fact that you have the randomized events, as I just said. Randomized puzzles, randomized enemies, randomized items, random Nemesis. All of that. Hell, your, your weapons are randomized. So you go into the RPD... You open the open the uh, the locker, and it will either be the magnum or the grenade launcher, and that actually impacts your run because if you get the magnum, you'll be able to take on Nemesis easier. But you don't get you don't get ammo for the magnum for a good while. But if you get the grenade launcher, you get ammo frequently throughout your run, so you can go ahead and reload your grenade launcher. So it's kind of like you know a benefit and a negative, a pros and cons to every run. The way that it works. So replayability. Got a little sidetrack there. Well, you have the randomized events. So every game, or every time you boot this game up, it's going to feel a little different. Every time. You won't know what puzzle you have. You won't know the solutions. You won't know if Nemesis is going to come and shove a rocket launcher up your ass. You won't know. On top of that, you also have mercenary mode. You can use mercenary mode to play through mini games with the different mercenaries to be able to get points and unlock different weapons, different items, including unlimited ammo. And that that unlimited ammo will apply to every weapon that you have. So there's a lot of replayability and then we have epilogues. So you have the so every time you complete the game, you will get a new epilogue for that game. And the epilogues basically detail the events that happen with all the other characters after Raccoon City. This includes, but not limited to, Chris, Leon, Claire, Ada, Sherry, like all of these characters. I think there's a total of eight epilogues. So that's eight playthroughs right there just to get the epilogues. Like, honestly, I feel like you get your money's worth with this game, especially, you know, back then when you paid $50, $60 for the game. These days, how much is Resident Evil 3 going for? Well, on PS1, it's going for about 
don't even get me started on the GameCube version because holy crap, that GameCube version is expensive. We all know it is. Let's just move on. We're going to move on. Now, while Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 1 offered different choices with your characters, which added to the replayability of it, Nemesis only allows you to play with Jill. Now, there is a section that you play with Carlos, but that is just for one section. It's not like an entire playthrough with Carlos. And yeah, I mean, it's okay. That uh, The section is the hospital section. It's, it's really short. It's not like the best thing in this game. But, I mean, it's it's there, I guess, to kind of change it up a little bit for you. Now, as far as the story goes, like I said, it chronicles the events of Jill escaping Raccoon City. Uh, but this event actually becomes very important to the lore moving forward. And the reason why is because in Resident Evil 5, you see the return of Jill and Chris. And something happens with Jill and Wesker. Not that kind, get your mind out of the gutter. We're not talking about the Welcome to Raccoon City movie, okay? This is... They're enemies in this in these games, all right? Anyways, it's presumed that Jill is dead, but it turned out that Wesker was experimenting on her body because she has T-virus antibodies due to the events of Resident Evil 3. So, it kind of, like, mutates her once he starts experimenting on her. But anyways, that's for Resident Evil 5 talk. Resident Evil 3, going through these events, again, has an impact. I mean, Raccoon City is destroyed in this game. It wasn't destroyed in RE2. In this game, they nuke Raccoon City. Did I say spoiler warnings for a 20-year-old game? Anyways, anyways, going through Raccoon City, you have different choices on how you want your game to progress. So, for example... Your first meeting with Carlos can be determined on your own pathing. Now, the natural path is to follow Carlos into the diner. But if you choose to just be like, nah, I'm not going to follow you because I'm a rebel. I'm going to go a different way. Well, if you go a different way, you end up in the news station and you encounter Carlos in the news station for the first time. And that will go ahead and change the item placements of key items, which is really freaking cool. That's something that the developers, you know, they 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 thought of when they were making this game. And you don't see that happen in a lot of different games, right? You have different encounters and it's like, oh, okay. So if the player chooses to go this other path, well, we need to account for that option. How can we do this? And so they go ahead and they move key items to take into consideration that you just decided to break the natural pathing and go your own motherfucking way. So that's really cool that they do that. And they do this in different sections because you can also, if you decide to, when you have free range to go back into Raccoon City after you meet all the mercenaries in the tram or the cable car, if you choose to go back to the cable car before completing all your tasks, you get you get a different cutscene. You get really cool things happen in this game just by going back when you're not supposed to go back. When the game wants you doing other things. So you get a cool cutscene of Mikhail being all badass, taking out a bunch of zombies while he's like on death row. And you wouldn't see this otherwise if you decide if you didn't decide to just break your pathing and decide to go back to the cable car full well knowing that there's nothing there for you this isn't the first time it does this either like dario one of the first characters that you interact with in the game dario he locks himself inside of like uh in, in the back of a box truck or something and if you if you just leave it there you don't know what happens to him. But if you decide to backtrack all the way back to the beginning, even though you don't have to, there's no reason for you to do this, right? Like there, there is there is nothing there except for some, uh, some gunpowder, which I guess could be a reward for going all the way back to the beginning is getting some gunpowder. But you don't need it because by this point, you have a ton of ammo anyways. But if you go back, if you decide to go back, you see that this, this, uh, this box car or, you know, where he locked himself in that container is burst wide open and you find Dario's dead body getting eaten by zombies, which then you have to kill and or you don't have to kill them. You can avoid them if you want to, but I killed them. 
because Dario, even though he was a douchebag. And you go inside his, uh, you, where he was hiding out in the container, and you'll find the gunpowder. You'll also find his diary, which I guess is kind of important if you want to go ahead and collect all the, uh, all the articles and all the, uh, the items. So I guess kind of important, but not really. It's a side thing. You don't need to do it, but if you do it because you want to, and you're rewarded for it. The game does this quite a bit, and I love it. it it's different. Resident Evil 2 didn't do this. Resident Evil 1 didn't do this. Resident Evil 4 doesn't do this. No other Resident Evil does this. Because pretty much after 3, or well, after Code Veronica, they became linear for a good while. Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6 were linear games. Resident Evil 7 went back to the old formula, but still didn't have different events that happen. Except towards the end of the game. But again, we're not talking about Resident Evil 7. We're getting sidetracked here. Gotta stop getting sidetracked. Come on, man. Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, basically, it cements Jill as, like, the badass woman that we as Resident Evil fans know her to be. When a lot of people think of Jill from Resident Evil, most of the time they think of Resident Evil 3 Jill. Very rarely will you hear Jill from Resident Evil 5 or Revelations. Like, Jill from Resident Evil 3 is, in my opinion, the most iconic Jill. This was the moment... That Jill became my favorite character in pretty much almost all of video game history. And while I love playing as Jill in Resident Evil 1, she was my default playthrough because her story felt more complete, uh, more complete than Chris's, anyways. It wasn't until Resident Evil 3 Nemesis where Jill was like, I love this character. I absolutely love this character. She is badass. She takes no shit from anybody. And when when shit hit the fan, she went ahead and was like, you know what? I'm going to take matters in my own hands and I'm getting the hell out of Dodge. And that's what she did. She didn't care about any of the other characters that were like trying to get in her way. She did what she needed to do while still trying to help people. Failing, but still trying to help people. What also makes this game more personal is your choices. This game is constantly giving you choices, choices to fight nemesis, choices to go different ways, choices when it comes to the villains of these games or of this game. So you have spoilers, I guess. Again, 20 year old game. They did a remake of it. Whatever. You have Nikolai, who's one of the mercenaries, but it turns out he is an agent for Umbrella that is watching all of this unfold and taking data to go ahead and give to Umbrella. Well, towards the end of the game, depending on your choices, depends on Nikolai's or changes Nikolai's fate. So depending on your choices, because the game gives you choices when it comes to Nikolai's fate. The first one being when you encounter Nemesis towards the end of the game, when you get towards the dead factory, you're on a bridge with Nemesis. You're given two choices, one to push Nemesis off or one to jump off yourself. If you push Nemesis off, then you lock in Nikolai's fate where Nemesis is, he goes and kills Nikolai in a pretty damn cool way. This is probably my favorite way that Nikolai dies because when you go to where Nikolai dies, you see him hanging from the ceiling and it's glorious. Like, it, it's, it's just glorious. The other way is if you jump off at that point with Nemesis, then Nikolai gets a hold of a helicopter and you're given another choice when you encounter him in the helicopter. You can fight him or you can negotiate with him. If you fight him, you then still have another choice. You can go ahead and shoot the helicopter until it blows up. Or you can just wait it out until he leaves. If you shoot the helicopter until it blows up, well, obviously Nikolai dies. If you wait till he leaves, well, then he leaves. If you negotiate with him, then he leaves again. Now, for me... The canon ending would be to negotiate with him and, and, you know, obviously jumping off the bridge because then this actually activates another point to the game, which is another ending. The normal ending would be to go ahead and push Nemesis off or, yeah, just push Nemesis off. That's the normal ending. Because then it activates the ending where Carlos gets a helicopter to then fly you and himself out of Raccoon City before the nuke comes and blows it up. The 
other ending, which is the special ending, I call this the canon ending, when you jump off and you negotiate with Nikolai, and then when you get to the end of the game, it's not Carlos who has a helicopter, it's Barry. Barry comes back for his partner Jill and flies them away from Raccoon City. That is, to me, the canon ending. I love this ending just because it's a cameo from Barry Burton, and Barry is awesome. Even if he did betray us in Resident Evil 1. But we forgave Barry. So Barry's awesome. Plus, you know, Resident Evil, uh, you know, Revelations 2 is just great. But we'll get there. We'll get there. I love this game. I really do. This was my first Resident Evil that I personally bought. It wasn't the first one I played. The very first Resident Evil was the first one I played. But this was the first one that I personally bought and owned. And the reason why is because when I bought my PS1, it was around this time when Nemesis had had come out. The PS2 was basically around the horizon. That's why Code Veronica released, well, I mean, Code Veronica released on the Dreamcast and then the PS2. But you get the idea. We'll get to Code Veronica later. One thing that this game does that Code Veronica doesn't, which bothers me about Code Veronica, not about this one, is that you can run upstairs without having to push a button to run upstairs, right? Like in Resident Evil 1 and 2 and in Code Veronica, when you get to a set of stairs, you have to push an action button to run up the stairs. In Nemesis, you don't have to do that. And that has a lot to do with the fact that it was two different developmental teams between Nemesis and Code Veronica. And so because they didn't communicate with each other, you don't, you're don't missing out features such as that. And I think that's kind of like a, a, a nice quality of life feature that I would have loved to have seen in Code Veronica, but it's fine. It's not too big a deal. It's just something that I thought I'd mention. But Nemesis, to me, like, I, I love the tense feeling that the game gives you as Nemesis himself is chasing you through Raccoon City. You never know where he's going to pop up, or at least it's your first time playing through the game or first couple times. You know, it, it's things like that, things like the randomized features with the puzzles and the items and the enemies. It just makes this game feel special to me. And... Like I mentioned, this was the first Resident Evil game that I personally bought, so that also has a lot to do with it. But Jill being my favorite character, like everything just falls into place for me when it comes to this game and why I love this game. And I don't think I'm ever going to feel any other way, you know, when it comes to this game. And so to do like an actual rating for this game for me is difficult because I, I'm blinded by nostalgia on this one. I absolutely love playing through this game. And like recently in the span of a month, I think I played through this game like five times. No joke. Just to record footage. And like I I kept on having excuses to replay the game saying like, oh yeah, I messed up my footage so I need to re-record it. You know, like just stupid stuff like that. I can sit down and play through this game in one sitting, beat the game in like three to four hours, and I'm happy to do so. You know, a lot of people want to say that the game feels short. No, to me, the game is still the same length as any other Resident Evil game. In fact, Resident Evil 2 is shorter than this one is to me. Because of the fact that you have so many places to explore in Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. But again, not a speedrunner. I'm a normal player. To me, speedrunning the game is beating the game in three hours, and I'm happy to do that. But anyways, I love this game. And I will always love this game. This is this is a game that I will continue to play. And if my PS1 disc breaks for whatever reason, I will play it on emulator. I will always find a way to play this game. I have multiple copies of this game on PS1 in case something happens to one of my copies. So, yeah. It's my favorite Resident Evil game. And I'm glad that you guys could hear me express how I felt with this one. Even if we didn't go into developmental history or anything like that, because, again, a lot of other reviewers or YouTubers have done that. And I wanted to share my thoughts and feelings for this game, because it's my favorite Resident Evil. The next one, though, is not my favorite Resident Evil. Not even close. But I guess we'll talk about Code Veronica when we get to it. With that, thank you so much for watching. And I hope you enjoyed yourself in my Resident Evil retrospective.